Hi, Luke Bosman from the Weekly Holler here. Every year around Groundhog Day, I start to look forward to spring, especially putting in my garden. In fact, I was just working on refinishing the handle of this hoe here. This week I have a special interview for you with one of my all-time favorite bloggers. Her name is Tipper Presley and she runs The Blind Pig and the Acorn, a blog dedicated to promoting and preserving Appalachian culture and tradition. We talk about many things in our interview, including Appalachian recipes, the dialect and music of the mountains, and even a little bit of gardening. I hope you enjoy it. So Tipper Presley is the blogger behind The Blind Pig and the Acorn, a blog dedicated to celebrating and preserving Appalachian culture. And when it comes to Appalachian culture, The Blind Pig and the Acorn delivers it in spades. It's a treasure trove of oral history, advice on planting by the signs, Appalachian sayings, down-home cooking, and traditional mountain music. Tipper, thanks for joining us, and welcome to the Weekly Holler. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me, Luke. So, um, there's a lot of things I'm looking forward to talking to you about, but first, uh, I would love to hear how you came to start the, the Blind Pig and the Acorn. Okay. Um, I started the Blind Pig and the Acorn in 2008, so I've been doing it almost coming up on 10 years now. But uh, when I first started the Blind Pig and the Acorn, I was kind of, I had went through, I guess you'd call it a rough patch of life, you know, and was kind of looking for something to, to help me just get back on track. And um, I'd always had a great passion for my culture and you know, I loved antiques and hearing the old stories my dad and mom would tell, that kind of stuff. And um, about that same time, one of my friends told me that she had a blog. Well, I thought blogs was on, were only, you know, political in nature, that kind of thing, or for businesses. Sure. I didn't realize I could blog about anything. Well, so once I read hers, hers was predominantly about her children, so that um, relatives that lived, you know, far away could see what was going on in her kids' life. But anyway, once I found hers, I found all these others. You know, you, you can blog, and I realized you can blog about anything. So that's kind of how, and then through that, I kind of, uh, with the help of a local small business center, developed my plan and decided, well, I wanted to, you know, this was a chance for me to try to preserve and, and, and to celebrate what I cared a lot about, which was my Appalachian culture and heritage. Well, that's wonderful. Now, um when it comes to celebrating and preserving Appalachian culture and heritage, um, is it something that you feel like you, you've always uh, uh, been aware of? Um, or was there a point in your life where you, you kind of had your eyes open to the traditions and things that you'd been raised with? I, I think I was raised with, or I know I was raised with just a, a real appreciation for those type of things, you know, just to be grateful and to with a real strong sense of family and a sense of place, you know, those kind of things. So I already had that. But um, probably when I first realized that maybe everybody else didn't have it, other areas of the country and stuff, uh, the first time I moved away from home, which I didn't move very far, (laughs) but about three counties away, so I was still in Appalachia, but I worked at a place, a meeting facility, where people come from all over the country, sometimes even all over the world, to have meetings, you know, at our facility. And um, I think it was when I worked there I first noticed because people would comment about my accent, you know, and, and other co-workers that worked in the area that I did, they had my accent, you know, they were local people. So they would ask us, most of the time it was nice <laughs> <that> <laughs> <laughs> about our accent. Sometimes that was more of a, you know, kind of snarky, but that they couldn't understand us or something. But anyway, along with that, there was also people that really were interested, you know. They would ask, you know, well, what about our traditions and about folklore? I guess they had already read maybe about Appalachia or about the mountains of North Carolina. And um, I think that's when I first began to realize, hey, you know, everybody else don't live like this. This is not the same, you know, as other places. And I think that um, for some people, I've read people from that grow up in Appalachia and they move away, they have that same experience. And sometimes it makes them want to hide, you know, who they are or, or be more mainstream, not be as obvious that they were from the mountains or the haulers. But for me, for some reason, it just made me want to hold on to that more. It's almost like it made me feel like, well, I must be in a secret club, you know. <laughs> yeah. All this stuff. So it made me want to hold on to it even more. 
Uh, and then shortly after that, I come back home and I went to college. And in college, I had an Appalachian Studies class. And I think that really solidified me thinking, wow, this is really something that, you know, I, I've appreciated. But I didn't realize that the rest of the world wasn't like that and that, you know, it was something to be celebrated and to be proud of. Absolutely. So, um, you know, in, in the age that we live in, I think you see a lot of small regional cultures kind of being integrated into to larger national cultures. And why do you think it's important to preserve these little regional traditions and, and cultures that we have? Well, you know, it's kind of like that saying how you, you've got to know where you've been to know where you're going. I think that's part of it is that you got to know who you are, your family, and there's so much. It's fascinating, and, and, and this does not just, I'm not saying this just pertains to Appalachia. This is all over the entire world, but it's fascinating how cultures, uh, their traditions, their folklore, their dialect, just everything about them, how that solidifies who you are. You know, from your family unit, the things that you do in your little family unit, to the wider, you know, your community, your neighbors, um, all those kind of things. I think it's just important that it gives you that sense of belonging, uh, whether you're in Appalachia or somewhere else. I happen to be in Appalachia, but it's that, that, um, that sense of belonging to a larger community who has the same... Uh, traditions and folklore and all those kind of things, cares about the kind of thing. I guess that's similar, too, if they were raised in the same community, then they, you know, can kind of look at you and be like, yeah, I know all about that. I've been there, done that, that kind of thing, you know? Sure, that camaraderie, yeah. Right. I think it's important for for all people, but I can only speak for me and for Appalachia, for us to have that sense of each other, a sense of community, that it makes us stronger. I certainly agree with that. I've found uh, talking to bloggers and, and also running a blog myself that having your own blog often turns into quite the adventure and you make a lot of discoveries. Um, what are some of your favorite stories that you've discovered uh, while you've been running the blind pig in the acorn? Uh, well, I've learned a lot. Because uh, Appalachia is a huge area, you know, and I live in what would be called the Southern Highlands. I live in the mountains of Western North Carolina, but the Southern Highlands of Appalachia. But, there's, but it goes, you know, all the way to Pennsylvania, <laughs> and then it goes below me. So it's a huge area. So it's fascinating that, you know, um, in my area, predominantly, we had the uh, influence from people that had moved here that were from Scotland or Ireland. Farther north, I've learned from people there's a whole German influence that I don't see that as much in my area. Becoming a blogger, of course, in the beginning, I thought I had these, I wanted to celebrate Appalachia, but I also kind of had the idea of grandeur, you know, maybe I'll make money, maybe I'll, this will be my living, which I still have that, but it's not happened. <laughs> <laughs> but what has happened is meeting so many different people and enriching my life by them, them sharing their life with me. You know what I mean? There's people that read my blog that live, you know, the same kind of life I do. There's people who grew up in Appalachia but had to leave, and they never got over missing that, you know. And then there's people that um, that never have been here, don't even know anything about it, but they just find it fascinating. And uh, one of my readers in Australia, that's how he's from Australia, never been to Appalachia, but two generations back when he was doing his genealogy, those ancestors grew up, were born and raised in Appalachia. So, you know, there's these neat... I guess spider web, you connect with each other, you know. So that's been a really neat thing that I've enjoyed and a blessing. And, and like I said, I hadn't monetarily gained. <laughs> but I think those riches are, are more important than money, those connections that I've made like that. It, it's so true. Um, I think uh, our lives are enriched when we, you know, when you have a connection with somebody that you've never even met, uh, you know, in person. And that is, is kind of, a unique thing that you get through something like a blog. Oh, it is. Yeah, that communicating, uh, like you said, even though you may not never meet, but that one-on-one -on -one communication that you feel like you're getting uh, and sharing something that you both genuinely care about. Absolutely. So um, what do you find is the most popular subject on your blog? There's, there's so many cool things that you cover. Uh, probably my most popular uh, is dialect. I talk about, you know, the language of Appalachian. That's probably the, the most popular feature. Uh, every I do a lot of individual dialect posts, 
but every month I have an Appalachian vocabulary test. Okay. So people can take the test. And uh, in the past year, I've been able to add little short videos of myself or whoever saying the words because um, over the years I realized some of the words, it, you just need to hear them instead of just see them, you know, on paper. And, of course, if you're not from Appalachian, you may not know how exactly it is said. You know, it's not a word you're familiar with. But um, those dialect posts are probably, that probably is my most popular feature, I would say. Uh, probably behind that would be maybe the, uh, some of the recipes and then the music, since my family is, uh, you know, musical. I have to say, you got a lot of talent in that household. I really enjoy the uh, the picking and grinning in the kitchen posts that you make. The the songs are just wonderful. Oh wow! Well, thank you, thank you. Um, so you were saying that that these uh, dialect posts are are some of your uh, your most popular. What are some of your favorite Appalachian sayings or uh, ones that you use or that you've heard that, that have stuck with you? Um, oh gosh, there's so many to choose from. It might be, might be tough. Um, some of the, like the sayings, more of the sayings, probably one I love is alaw. It just means like alaw, I don't know, you know. <laughs> if there's nothing else you can say about something, you don't know what else to say about it. Um, another one I like is, uh, comes to mind is spit and image. If somebody's in your spit and image, you know, could be something that's like I, I say, my daughter Katie is a spit and image of Pap, my daddy, because she looks just like him, you know. Um, there's the funny ones, you know, that like the finer than frog hair or scarce as hen's teeth. Those, those, those are good ones. Um, one of my favorite ones, I don't really hear anybody say, but I've never got over hearing it. Um, one of the my readers in the in the very beginning sent it to me, and her grandmother she said would say it, and it says it would say to somebody that was you know not a good person, somebody that was being mean or bad, she would say your milk of human kindness has turned to Bonnie Clapper. <laughs> has turned to Bonnie Clapper. I never got over that. I thought that is so descriptive and so you think about it, that we all humans have that kindness in us, but then sometimes it does turn, you know. Not Very really visual, like, too, if you've if you've ever yeah, milked yeah, cows. and. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, I need to say it myself, but I don't. But I do think about it sometimes. You know, I, I find that uh, Appalachia is just really a region that I think cares about language, and, and people put a lot of thought into, the, into some of these sayings. You know, they're very creative. Um, and, and very descriptive like that. Uh, uh, my, my grandpa um, is kind of the the source of a lot of the sayings in, in my family, and uh, he's he's fond of using uh, spitting image, and uh, um, he's got he got some other ones too. I, I think one that uh, comes to mind is he likes to say that you know if, if you give him something new that he thinks is real uh, neat or uh, innovative, he'll say well. Isn't this slicker than snot on a doorknob? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a very descriptive. One. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it, you're right. It's um, I don't know. It's just our language, the Appalachian language, is so rich and so colorful and such meaning, like that human kindness. That, I mean, what meaning? But uh, another one I thought of is, I'm sure you've heard people say, like I could say it to you, I'm proud to be here. I'm proud that you... Uh, you know, ask me to be interviewed, to interview me. But it, that doesn't mean that I'm proud that I think I'm something. It's a different way of saying it. It's almost like saying uh, I'm humbled. I'm, I can't even believe that you ask me. So I'm so humbled and blessed, you know, if you heard yeah. you heard proud to be here, you know. Yeah, so I've heard that. Uh -huh. Someone was familiar with it might think, well, you know, well, who do they think they are? It's just saying, oh, my goodness, I, I'm honored. You know, it's a way, really, of saying I'm honored. Now that I think about it, um, you know, I used to go to a lot of square dances growing up, and, and I can remember some of the bands saying that. You know, we're, we're proud to be here to, to play the music for you. I can, I remember, uh, I can hear preachers that said that, you know, like a visiting preacher or something, I'm proud to be here. But he wasn't saying, now I'm here, everything's going to be perfect. It was just his way of saying, I'm honored that you asked me, that you asked me to come to your church and speak, you know. 
but it's one of those, like you said, totally different meaning than the word than how the word is usually used. Yeah. So I saw um, that you teach Appalachian cooking classes at the John C. Campbell Folk School. But what what kind of dishes do you like to teach people to make in that class? Um, it is a great school, so if you ever get the chance, it's a real experience. People say they, you know, once you go, then you got to go back. <laughs> it's that kind of thing. The things that I teach usually. Usually I'll teach, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, try to do jellies and jams and maybe pickles, that kind of thing, because it's, it's usually a week-long class, and there's certainly food that we cook that we eat right then. The students want to be able to take something home with them. They want to take something back. Uh, whereas if you were at the folk school and you were taking a basket class, basket making, you'd probably take a basket home with you by the end of the week, you know or maybe more than that. But anyway, so we usually do some jellies and uh, jams and pickles, that kind of thing. Usually we make kraut, at least one small jar of kraut, so they can see the fermenting process. Um, and along with that, then we do, you know, pies and cakes usually. Um, but try to focus on the traditional ones or ones local in this area that are kind of popular. Of course, I bring the ones from my family, and I usually also do cornbread and biscuits so that I can show them how, you know, some families do it different, but how my family makes cornbread and biscuits. Okay. So do any of the dishes that you teach have a, an interesting history or, or history within your family? Uh, probably the one that... Uh, one of the ones, and I always try to make it, and it does have with my family, and it's an arsh potato cake. Well, the word arsh, how I'm saying it, is really a corruption of Irish, so an Irish potato, which just means a white potato, just a regular potato. But when I was growing up, my mother and father, who I call Granny and Pap on the, on the blog, they called those arsh potatoes. So you had sweet potatoes or you had arsh potatoes, you know. And that using that term arsh potato is common throughout Appalachia to describe a white, just a potato, white potato. But uh, the recipe, it's a really old one. Uh, my mother, Granny, she got it years ago when I don't even know if I was born or not, but uh, she was working with a lady that she rode to work with, you know, and the lady gave it to her, and it had come from someone in her family. This lady was from Clay County, North Carolina, which is just down the road from us. But uh, it was really, you could tell it was an old recipe because it used, the descriptions were things like a lump or um, the size of a walnut. You know, it didn't have regular measurements. But um, it also has potatoes in it. So arsh potato cake it actually has mashed potatoes in it. So it, that's kind of a historical thing is using what you've got, you know, using what you had on hand. So if you had leftover potatoes. It also has uh, black walnuts in it, which black walnuts are native to the Appalachian region, you know. So and it's really good besides all that history, but um, but it's a really really a um, I would say like a cake that you would make it a special for something special, you know, Christmas, um, a reunion, a potluck, something like a homecoming or something like that. It would be like kind of a fancier cake that you would make. Okay, I'll have to try that out. That sounds interesting, and I love anything with black walnuts in it. Oh yeah, me too. Uh, you can find it. Uh, the recipe on the blind pig and the acorn, so you can find it there. Okay, I'll have to I'll have to look for that and uh, and give it a give it a whirl. That, that sounds great. So um, one of the other things that uh, that uh, you post about that I've been particularly interested in is is uh, the idea of, of planning by the signs, and um, I've I've found it fascinating that you've been doing you have done some tests on on uh, planning by the signs over the years. And uh, I was just curious, have you found it to be effective? I have found it to be effective. Um, when I was growing up, Mom and Daddy, Granny and Pap always had a garden every year. We had one. But but they did not go by the signs. Uh, between, it wasn't necessarily that they didn't believe in them, but Pap, he, you know, he worked full time. He had the whole music thing going. So he had that. He was a baseball coach. He was a deacon at church and a Sunday school teacher. So between all of his obligations in life, he just had to plant whenever he could plant, you know, basically. So I didn't grow up in a family that went by the most. Granny did always go by the signs if she was pickling or fermenting like kraut, making kraut or pickled beans and corn. They did not when they were gardening. But after I started the blind pig and the acorn, I become interested in it. And I was beginning, my husband and I uh, had been gardening ourselves since we were married. 
every year. But um, so once I got interested in it, I kind of started trying to dabble in it. And I read about it and read about it. And the first year that we did it, I just chose like a fruitful sign, which was, uh, I think I chose cancer, the sign of the crab, like the little crab, that's the, the most fruitful zodiac sign. And it seemed like our garden did so much better. It was just crazy. So I was a believer right then, you know. But then the next year, I just got so technical about it, and I tried to do everything. Um, I mean, kind of in a nutshell, it's that you should plant above-ground crops under a fruitful sign when the moon is waxing or increasing, and then you should plant the root crops or the below-ground crops under a fruitful sign while the moon is waning or decreasing. Well, I got so obsessed with that that I just... I, our garden did good, but I drove myself crazy. <laughs> I didn't enjoy it. So then the next year, I thought, I'm still going to do it, but I'm going to go back to what I did in the beginning. So for me, instead of worrying about the increasing or decreasing, I just use the zodiac signs. So I choose um, usually four, Taurus, Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces is what Matt and I use, like to use, and, and those are the signs. We just try to plant under those signs. And, um, and it really does work, you know. And for people that tell me, oh, it, you, that's just a bunch of hogwash, it doesn't work. I say, well, if for nothing else, maybe it works because if you're going to plant by the signs, you have to be more organized. You have to think ahead of what you're going to plant. For me personally, you know, when you think about the moon and the orbit of the earth and the tides and the oceans and all that, I'm like, how could it not be? How could it not help? Anyway, so I try, so I do... Um, and last year our garden didn't do as well and we didn't plant by the signs and the reason we didn't was uh, if you've been reading my blog you probably already know but last April Pap uh, passed away we lost Pap so I was just like who cares you know and so I mean I didn't even want to plant a garden but we did but we more or less did it whenever I could get the gumption to walk outside and do something and uh, and it didn't you know, at the end of the season, Matt said, well, I'm, I'm disappointed, and uh, he was disappointed in the green beans, but I said, well, we didn't plant them by the signs. Anyway, so I, I am a firm believer in planting by the signs. So for somebody that's that's wanting to get started in, in planting by the signs and maybe is, you know, a total newbie, has doesn't know what the zodiac is or, or uh, how to find out, you know, when different signs are, how would you recommend that they get started? One of the <clears throat> the easiest ways is in their local area. Uh, here in my area, it's usually a funeral home or a bank. A lot of those kind of places hand out when they give out their new calendar in January. They give out a it's a planting calendar. Uh, some of them are you've probably seen the ones that are like uh, white with red and black writing on them. I don't yeah. Know yeah, well, those are planting calendars. Some of them are not like that. Some of them are, have pretty pictures and all that, but they're still. Uh, planting calendars but those calendars make it really easy for you because if you you can look in that little square that has the date and it also gives you what zodiac sign it is and all that and it also and it'll tell you the moon phase if you want to get that in depth and then within that calendar there's going to be a little key somewhere that tells you what's all the signs and what's fruitful and what's not you know what's barren you don't want to plant a barren sign of course so uh, most of the time those like here in my area, the funeral homes, they give them away for free. You just have to remember to make sure you pick yours up, you know, in January or whenever. You can also buy those calendars online, and they're not very much, like $3.49, something like that. I think it's like the American Calendar Company or something. One year I had to buy one because I pulled around and didn't get one, and then by the time I tried to get one, they were all had already given them all out. But that's an easy way and a cheap way, and then you're just looking at a calendar, you know. I think I'll have to give that a try this year. You know, it, it always seems like it's right in the dead of winter when I start really thinking about the garden. And yeah, and it's more, it's like I, like I did myself the second year that I tried it. You can you overload yourself and then you're like oh my god i mean because you know gardening is enjoyable but it's also work <laughs> but it does help like i said even for people that are non-believers it, it at least because you go look ahead and think well i can plan on you know these you it just time gets away from us so fast these days that it's good to be able to force yourself to look ahead especially as a gardener you know yeah so tipper i really appreciate you uh doing this interview uh why don't you tell uh folks where 
where they can find the blind pig and the acorn and, and uh, how they can participate and enjoy all the wonderful things you have to offer on, on there. You can go to blindpigandacorn.com or if it's easier, you can just Google Blind Pig and the Acorn blog. I post something new every day, so you can just come every day or every few days or whenever you'd like to. Uh, or you can subscribe, and subscribing is totally free, doesn't cost anything. And subscribing just means that every day, every morning, you're going to get a little email that says, you know, this is new on the Blind Pig and the Acorn. But um, for anyone that's interested in preserving and, and celebrating our wonderful Appalachian culture and heritage, I really appreciate it if they would drop by whenever they could. Well, thanks again, Tipper. Okay, Lou, thank you so much. I'm All right. Proud to be here. I done told you, but it's true. I'm proud to be here. So. Oh, well, I'm, I'm proud to have you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye.